listening to ACDC Beyond the Thunder, the podcast with the biggest balls of all, with your hosts, Greg Squires and Greg Ferguson. It's time to rock. Hi, and welcome to our end of season two bonus episode where we take you behind the Beyond the Thunder podcast. I'm Eric Keel, but I'm usually behind the board. But today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to dig into some listener questions. Uh, really appreciate the feedback and the questions we received uh, through the first two seasons of the podcast. I think this is cool because it gives Kurt and Greg a chance to provide some insight into some of the interviews we have aired already and a few that haven't quite uh, made it out there yet. So Kurt, Greg, welcome to your own show. And uh, (laughs) why don't we get going here? Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Eric. I'm I'm excited for this episode because um, uh, Greg had the idea of taking listener questions. And uh, we do receive a lot of mail from around the world. So thank you, ACDC fans. Uh, and uh, we're kind of excited because we've married these uh, specific questions to a few guitar heroes uh, along the way that we interviewed. So we thought it would be a good combination. Yeah, always great to hear you guys' feedback. And it's, it's great to be able to answer your questions too. So let's, let's get to it. All right. So the first question we have here is from Ryan Van Katoven in Santa Cruz, California. And Ryan says, thank you. I've been an avid listener to your podcast on Spotify for a while now. It's great to hear the effect the boys have had on so many of us, famous or not. I'm a paramedic firefighter in Santa Cruz, California. And although I'm known as the ACDC guy, most of my coworkers' workout tunes include ACDC. I have such amazing memories throughout my life having to do with the boys, especially when I got a chance to meet them in 1996 as a 15-year-old, which is the peak of my ACDC obsession. It wasn't just a chance meeting at all. I truly believe it was divine. Anyway, thanks so much. You guys are great at keeping the flame lit. Awesome. That's pretty cool. Well, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for uh, thanks for writing in and, and asking questions. It's always good to have you guys' questions. And thank you for your service as a firefighter and a paramedic in, in Santa Cruz. Uh, pretty cool. The fact that you got to meet the bandmates, I mean, that's... That's a lot of a lot of people's dream right there, and and that you got to do it at 15 years old. It's pretty pretty cool, and it's probably had a great effect on your life, and 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 changed the course of how you view ACDC. So very cool. Yeah, and the, you know we do on this show feature famous ACDC fans, but then there are other types of heroes. So I would put Ryan in that category. Uh, thanks for being a listener. And um, got to ask, since you saw him on the Ball Breaker tour, I wonder if that song Burning Alive off the same album influenced Ryan to become <laughs> a firefighter, right? I wonder if, uh, you know, Ryan's ever on the way to a fire or something like that. And he's like, hey, turn this up and puts in a CD or something, you know, play a little ACDC on the way. You know, ACDC is always kind of on the lookout for a new prop. So there you have it. You get the bell, you get the cannon, you get the train. Why not a fire engine? (laughs) That's great. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) All right. So why don't we go to question number two? This is from Paul W. in Manchester, UK. Paul says, Love the podcast. Really brilliant, fun, and original idea. You seem to base your episodes around well-known individuals who've influenced ACDC within different disciplines. But have you ever approached individuals who have actually influenced ACDC themselves? I remember reaching out to everyone from Chuck Berry to Little Richard to B.B. King and Buddy Guy and even the late, great Johnny Winter, who was the only person who gave us the official yes out of all of those great blues dudes. Well, actually, I take that back. Little Richard said, okay, but then he asked how much. (laughs) (laughs) Greg and I had no money at that point, and we were like, "Uh, I don't know. how." I got like 40 bucks. 40 bucks, (laughs) 50 bucks, and then he goes, okay, and then he ghosted us. Yeah. Never heard back from him, so... But just that roster alone just shows you how long we've been at this, Kurt. Yeah, they're no longer with us. Buddy Guy said he might do it, but he 
reneged because he opened up for ACDC once and got booed off the stage. That's a tough opening spot. Isn't that That's terrible? That's a tough opening spot. Yeah. Tough yeah. for anyone to open. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's maybe okay if it's a young upcoming band. They got to they gotta take their lumps, but but a legend like that, that's And a he remembered spot. it too. He's yeah. like, yeah, you know, that yeah. wasn't a good experience. I don't want to do this. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, we have a very cool story about Johnny Winter, and he's a, a huge influence on ACDC. And one of the few interviews that I was unable to make, Greg took the helm and I phoned up a good buddy of mine by the name of Herb Ivy uh, from Portland, Maine, who uh, is the captain on WBLM 102.9. And tell us a little bit about what happened that day when you finally tracked down Johnny Winter, Greg. Yeah, well, you know, he was coming to play in my hometown, so we did our did our legwork, and and you know, Kurt reached out and set this up, and it was. Uh, you know, something I was really excited for and, and definitely going to be a cool interview. It was the dead of winter. I think it was probably December or, or maybe it was January. I forget what month it was, but it was cold out. Show up to the club early. We were supposed to interview Johnny uh, before the sound check, I believe. And we get there and, you know, we meet with his manager, uh, producer, uh, Paul Nelson. And he's like, you know, Johnny's not ready. Can we do it after sound check? So everything kind of got postponed and we're hanging around waiting. And there was a couple other media crews there as well to, to talk to Johnny. Paul kind of discreetly comes up to me and says, okay, we're ready. And so uh, this was after the sound check and everything. And yeah. he comes up and says, you know, follow me. So it was, it was just a really skeleton crew. It was Herb, myself, and um, I also had a friend who was helping me out who is a photographer takes us outside of the venue and he's like, we're going to go to the tour bus. So, you know, I'm thinking, oh, we're going to hop on this, the big RV and sit down and, and hang out and, you know, chat up Johnny Winters. It's going to be really cool. So we come around the corner and it's literally like a, like a camper van <laughs> with a big trailer on the back. So he uh -huh. was, you know, Johnny was doing this New England tour at this point and that was their mode of transportation. So, we, uh, we, we got on board. It was super tight in there. I'm trying to like fit all my camera gear in there, set up a tripod and, you know, we're all trying to kind of find our little space in there. And yeah. then, uh, you know, Johnny, Johnny comes out and uh, sits down at the table. He's like, okay, boys, what are we here to talk about? And so like, I don't even know if he was prepped or not, but, uh, we're like, we're here to talk about ACDC. And he was like, who are those guys? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if he was joking. You know, he had, he had a pretty good sense of humor. But uh, that's, that was kind of setting the tone for, <laughs> for this interview. Uh, um, and, you know, Johnny's been through a lot at this point, And he's, a, he's an older, older gentleman, really soft-spoken guy at this point. And so we're all just trying to listen in and, and hear what he had to say. He didn't have a lot to say. And, you know, some of the questions were really uh, just kind of pulling teeth, one word answer kind of things. But um, it was amazing to sit down with him and just kind of experience that whole thing. And it was a really short interview. And I think we're going to play some clips for you later. Those probably all the good sound bites that we got from Johnny that night. <laughs> well, we didn't know until after the fact, Greg, that there was a documentary that came out eventually yeah. Yeah. by this uh, director, uh, by the name of Greg Oliver. He did a great job. I think it's called Down and Dirty. Come to find out, Johnny was uh, pretty strung out at that time, and he was coming off methadone, and his manager, Paul Nelson, was slowly getting him off that drug. Uh, but when we were interviewing, he had a hard time stringing stuff together. So that made yeah. sense for why you got the one or two word answers, right? Yeah. And at the time, I didn't know any of this information, you know, and I think that's why Paul was really discreet. We were the only media crew allowed to talk to him that night. And, you know, our time with him was limited. Yeah. But, uh, you know, sitting on the van with him and talking to him and, and then, you know, going back into the audience, we, you know, we were there to see the show, too. And uh, just thinking to myself, like, how how is Johnny going to pull this off? You know, this is he's going to come out and play a full show. 
Right. There was no warm-up band or anything. And um, the lights go down, and then and Paul literally is helping Johnny get, you know, kind of navigate through the dark and get to his stool. He sits down, and he just starts playing and, and, and singing, and it was just like the hair on your arms just stood ah, up. It so was cool. amazing. Yeah. What a just such power. And, yeah, and it's like, you know, he was doing exactly what he wanted to be doing at that moment. He just loved to perform and, and loved the blues, and it was amazing. Came to it life. Was a truly amazing show. You know what was also amazing, we should note, before we play a couple of clips from this interview, the guy you mentioned, uh, our friend Louis Torrieri, who yeah. was taking stills that night. <laughs> I know where this is going. <laughs> yeah. He actually uh, took a bunch of stills of Johnny on his tour bus, and we sent a thank you like we do to everybody, every interview when we follow up, and we put the picture, you know, we threw a picture in there. Paul Nelson, Johnny's manager, goes, oh, my God, that's a great shot. Can we use that for Johnny's next album cover? And we're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and lo and behold, if you pick up the album Roots by Johnny Winter, that is the shot from our tour bus <laughs> from Out this a, very interview. Beyond the Thunder photo shoot. <laughs> yeah. Lewis yeah. is still yeah, looking Lewis for royalties it. on that shot, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, Eric, if you will, can you cue up uh, a little bit of this interview? Yeah, let's, let's roll some Johnny Winter here. You know, blues always made me feel good listening to it. You know, some people think it's sad, but it's really not. I mean, there's, there's some sad blues, too, but there's a lot of happy blues. It always made me feel good, though. I guess I was 12 or 13 when I first heard blues. I thought, this is unbelievable music. What is this stuff? I heard it on the radio first. Well, I think the first blues I heard was Howlin' Wolf. And I, th I just thought, this is great music. I've never heard anything like this before. I've got to learn how to do this. And it did, did change my life. I don't like too much of the modern, really modern music. Uh, I don't listen to hardly any of it. I just don't like the music today. It blues keeps coming in and out of fashion. You know, for a while it'll be real big, then it'll go down a little, and I don't really know why that happens, but uh, I wish it would just stay up. <laughs> so obviously Johnny is, you know, the blues is running through his veins, but then Herb asked him the question which uh, we had pre-written for him about Hard Again, which was the album he produced for Muddy Waters, his hero. And we bring that up because Hard Again was an album that Malcolm Young and Angus Young absolutely treasured. And they tried to emulate when they went in the studio to record Flick of the Switch. So if you hear a track from Hard Again, it's got this really raw, dry, live sound. Um, and then compared to Flick of the Switch, it's really got that same... Uh, not over, not overproduced at all. It's just live and dry. So let's listen to Johnny talk about uh, that time that he was in the studio producing Muddy Waters. It was a high point in my life. I would always loved Muddy's records. I lived listening to him since I was twelve or thirteen. So when I got a chance to work with him, I was in heaven. But that's just going to be really fun. And his records weren't very good right before he got with me and I, I was sure I could make him sound the way he used to. That was my, well, my aim was to make him sound like he did in the 50s. <laughs> it's hard to tell what the influence of somebody else. Yeah, Johnny really had a sense of humor that night too. Uh, one of the questions that we asked him is how he felt about being ranked number 74 in the, uh, the Rolling Stones top guitarist list of all time. And uh, right. his, his answer, Completely, completely priceless. I think I should be in the top five. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely think I should be in the top five. Oh, Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck, B.B. King, Buddy Guy. <laughs> Me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all good guitar players, have a lot of feeling and play well. That's got to have emotion. It's got to have feeling to it. I think that's the main thing. It's good for you. No matter how good you play, if you don't feel it, it not, doesn't translate well. I love that guy. How cool of an answer is that? Yeah, it's cool. So, so cool. And, you know, he, he puts 
the people he truly respects right at the top. And, and that's, that's pretty awesome. Right. All the blues guys, man. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then it's me. Yeah. Number right. Five. <laughs> Number five. And also kind of interesting, his uh, protege, so to speak, Angus, at the time that interview was ranked 96, but uh, he's he's moved up the charts here recently, right? In, in the last, last rating, he's number 24, so. Yeah, I know. These lists are so funny. I mean, they're arbitrary, but they're fun. Uh, they sell magazines. So they do. <laughs> did, did Johnny move up in the list too, or? Yeah, he did, actually. He moved to 63 from 74. But yeah, okay. We'll wait good. till the that's next good. listing to come out. He got the posthumous <laughs> 10 position bump. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but also the cool thing about um, the last parting shot that Herbert asked Johnny Winter was a message for ACDC. We always have a one word, but I'm not sure if we even went there because the interview was so kind of pokey, right? But yeah. we asked him if you had... Uh, one thing to say to ACDC, what would it be? Let's let's listen to what he said. Just keep doing it. Stay true to your roots. Which is really cool because the album that came out after that interview was was actually called Roots. Yeah, too crazy. And Lewis had shot the cover for it, so wow, maybe right. maybe that was all spawned out of our interview. Who knows? Yeah. Well, the, uh, it, what great advice, and and it's obviously something ACDC's done, right? Right. Okay, so moving on to question number three from Andrea Applegate in the U.S. of A. I love ACDC, and I have great affection for anyone else who loves ACDC, so obviously I'm really enjoying the Beyond the Thunder podcast. I'm disappointed that none of your guests are women. I can't believe there are no women who are influenced by the lads and their music. I suspect it's not that they don't exist, but it's that you haven't looked for them. I think women's stories should be just as entertaining and informative as men's. Thank you. Well, I'm glad I'm glad Andrea brought that up. We have asked a lot of women to be on our show and, and be in the film. And, and we have some interviews that we've done in the past that we're going to be bringing out hopefully in season three. So that will help, um, you know, get that female population represented. And we know that they they love ACDC. So it's definitely um, something that we want to do. Kurt, like who 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 did we talk to for the film? Well, uh, we did get Hell's Bells on this past yeah. season. Oh, yeah, that was since, season two, yeah. Since Andrea's letter came in. Uh, but prior to that, Thunderstruck, another yeah. all-female ACDC tribute band, was another great interview. We also talked with uh, Kathleen Edwards. Another great interview. Yeah, singer-songwriter. We met her on the beach of Cape Cod. Yeah. And that's that's something maybe to remind the listeners that uh, sometimes we've called what we've done to some of these historical interviews as reskinning, but sometimes we just were not quite the audio quality where we're comfortable with. So we're sitting on some stuff, still trying to figure out how we can how we can make it uh, easy on the ears. Some good content, and it, and it's not without trying too. We we've we've reached out to Lizzie Hale and Joan Jett and Drea De Matteo and Lucinda Williams and Nancy Wilson and. Kat Von D, and I mean, we're trying, believe it. We us. actually uh, kind of ambushed Kat Von D at her tattoo parlor. We, you know, we were in LA and we heard she was going to be there. And we stopped in to just say, hey, you know, we're here, we're available to film or, or you know, do an interview with you. And uh, that's right. We didn't, we didn't get through the, the first layer of security, but. Uh, <laughs> We were asked to leave, but we did buy T-shirts. Oh yeah, I got a really cool T-shirt there. I should have gotten a tattoo, but they, you know, you have to <laughs> book like months ahead. You can't That's just right. like stop yeah. in and, and get inked. So, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, Kathleen Edwards. Going back to that, she was a great interview. I mean, we caught her. I think she was getting ready for a gig that night, and we met her at this outside bar venue on Cape Cod, and. Uh, we interviewed her right on the beach. It was really a beautiful day. It was great. And uh, truly, you know, I'm a huge fan of ACDC. And um, yeah, and she does a great cover of Money Talks, actually. Absolutely. Absolutely. I remember I asked her for some advice. At the time, my daughter was probably, I don't know, seven, eight years old and studying violin. And, and I, I remember asking her, I'm like, I really want my, you know, my kid to be musical. Like what, what's, what's some advice that you can give me to help her stay connected to the instrument? And she said, just let her do her thing. You know, don't, don't be overbearing and just let her evolve and she'll become, 
you know, a better musician if she just kind of does it on her own. And uh, I did actually kind of follow that advice in a way. So kind of cool story. And to this day, my, my daughter's 19 and still loves playing the violin. So thanks, Something Kathleen. Worked. Yeah, thanks, Kathleen. <laughs> Very cool. Coming up, Kurt, who else could we interview? I mean, who, who do we want to reach out to next? And I keep saying Lady Gaga, you know, but apparently these people like that have a, a lot of things to do. So uh, they're, they're important. Yeah. So it's not, it's not quite as easy to, yeah. Maybe if our fans flood them with requests to, to be on our show, that would, that would help. We did ask um, Mike Frazier, ACDC's engineer, who he would recommend, and he mentioned Lady Gaga. Yeah. So there you go. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Mike, we need her. Yeah, need her let's work, work the connections. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, who do we have next, Eric? All right, question number four is from Martin P. in Valencia, Spain. Loved your interview with Slash. He truly is a fan. I'm a huge Guns N' Roses fan too and have been since Appetite for Destruction. Were you able to get an interview with Axel since he filled in for Brian Johnson or perhaps any other members of Guns N' Roses? If not, I'd also settle for Stephen King. <laughs> I would also I think, settle for Stephen yeah, King. Yeah, I was going to say, we would also settle for Stephen King. Not, not a lack of trying on Kurt's end That's there. right. You know, I have to say that even during Slash's interview that Greg and I did, Slash himself asked if we had Stephen King yet, yeah. and we were like, no, he won't do it. Do you know him? Can you hook us up? <laughs> you've gotten you've gotten within one degree of separation, right? You're you're close. They know very well who we are. <laughs> yeah, I think that also kind of speaks to uh, maybe we were all a little bit behind the scenes here, but we we were all thinking for uh, pandemic times, all these musicians and and people who were influenced by ACDC in other ways would would not be doing anything and have time for uh, podcast interviews. But what we figured out is they actually all started their own podcast. So they're, they're pretty busy. <laughs> that's right. We're competing against our right. guests. Well, the, that's a cool question. And to be honest with you, yes and no, Martin. First off, thanks for your kind words and, and glad you liked the Slash episode. We did too. We didn't talk with Axel, but who did we talk with, Greg? We actually talked to a guitarist, that was playing with Guns N' Roses at the time. You may know him by his nickname, Bumblefoot. Yes, otherwise known as Ron Thal. What, a, what an amazing guy and just really gracious and nice guy to talk to. We actually, yeah. we were at the Eddie Trunk show, the, the, that metal show. Yes. And I think, I think Eddie introduced us to him and um, we were That's there. Right. Like at the, oh yeah, we were there for the end of the season. So it was like the, the kind of the casting party kind of at the end. And it was, a rap, it was a rap party in New York City. Yeah. And Eddie said, why don't you guys come along, which was really cool. Yep. And he recommended we interview Bumblefoot, who's a huge ACDC fan for our film. I, I think he was a little kind of not shy, but just didn't want to deal with doing an interview. I mean, he'd probably yeah. been grabbed by so many people at that point, you know, when, when it was announced that he was going to be touring with GNR. And, but he did. He did actually uh, end up doing an interview with us, which was really cool. And you can tell him what happened. We, well, we were at the party and we, we, we were tracking him down and nothing was happening. We didn't think it was going to happen. So it's getting late. It's like midnight or something. Greg and I were like, <laughs> let's get out of here, man. We got to go pack up and get ready for the next day. And we're like, like halfway out of the city and we get a call from Bumblefoot. He's like, hey, guys, I'm ready. Let's do this interview. <laughs> we're like, okay, turn this boat around. And uh, we actually interviewed him in the middle of the street during a cold, rainy night, right? Yeah, yeah. We had like barely any light to, I think we were standing under a street light and we were, we were filming at this point and um, it was really cool. He's like, I just, he really did want to just talk about ACDC because I think it had a great influence on him and his career and told us some great stories. And, and for those of you who don't know about Bumblefoot, Bumblefoot replaced Buckethead. <laughs> who, replaced, who replaced Slash. But anyway, Bumblefoot was a monster on Chinese yeah. democracy. Oh, his playing and that is... It's phenomenal. Yeah. If you go back and listen to the track Better by uh, Guns N' Roses, it, it's, it's a classic song, an, an unsung classic song. So kudos to Bumblefoot uh, if, if you're uh, not up to speed on this guy. So let's, take, yeah. uh, let's go back and, and listen to some clips from this interview. I was playing guitar, I started when I was about six years old, and 
for me, it was, it was just the guitar thing that got me into it. When I first started getting into soloing after playing a couple of years, I was like nine years old. And ACDC Angus was, you know, he was just this wild, relatable kind of thing. And so I was very into that. I remember even, uh, you know, we were trying out this kid for our band. He was older than us. I was nine, maybe 10. It was the late 70s. And, and uh, I remember we were jamming and, and uh, I was just like, going crazy playing I'm like whipping my face around and spits flying out and I'm just like running around the room and the kid is just looking at me like I'm a freak I was like what's wrong with this kid I was like Angus you know it was like it was in your spirit you know and and he didn't have that he's like I can't play with you guys he's too young he's, you know you know but it was that you know that kind of wild spirit that you know influenced me and inspired me to be the same kind of way how cool is that I mean, yeah. 10 years old and, and having listened to ACDC and Angus and having that kind of set your course, yeah. set your course for, you know, what you want to do with your life. And, and that's, that's awesome. Can you imagine being that young and just being influenced by Angus Young, bobbing his head up and down, going crazy. And then having that come out, you know, later in life where that's actually what he's doing and, and making a living doing that. Yeah, and that's a good segue too, Greg, for this next clip because he talks about joining Guns N' Roses and finding his little niche in the band and bringing, yeah. bringing Angus to the forefront for, uh, for his inspirations. Let's check this out. I first started playing with them and we immediately just jumped into touring and it's a busy stage. There's a lot of people on that stage right now. Uh, you know, there's three guitar players, a bass player, two keyboard players, a drummer, Axel. Uh, and I was just trying to find my place in it all. And just, I was like, I don't know. Do I just kind of just like stand here and just hang out and play? Or like, what do I, like, I was just trying to figure out how I mesh. And on the tour bus, as we're just going through Europe, all we did is just watch these old bootlegs of ACDC. And I'm just watching them. I remember there was the one where they're in this theater and everyone's just sitting there watching, all calm, just, you know, applauding at the end. And, you know, the band just going, and Angus is everywhere. He's just, he's everywhere. He's just walking on things that a human being should not try and balance on. And he's just hopping along on the thing. And, and just, he did not stop moving the whole show. And, I was, and it, just watching that again, it just brought out that, that fucking nine-year-old in me again. And I was like, yeah. You know, time to like get back to that, <laughs> and sure enough, like starting like that next show, just I did not stop moving the whole show, and I just no one could catch me. I just dodging people, and just like did not stop moving, just you know, just <laughs> down on the end of one way, and just running a hundred feet across to the other way, and just hopping in the air, and just jumping up onto the, you know, playing with the drums, and back down, and just tried to. I did not stop moving. I lost thirty pounds was 30 wow. fucking pounds just from sweating up there doing that. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was that was the inspiration to just get my ass moving. Well, with the Axel, I mean, there was one point we were even jamming an old, you know, ACDC tune that we were thinking about covering. Uh, we did a lot of stuff. I'm trying to remember. We did Beating Around the Bush, did uh, Problem Child. I don't know, just like random, you know, it just comes up. You know, the whole thing of even when we were on tour, you know, a bunch of us went to, uh, when we were in Perth, we drove up to Fremantle and visited Bon Scott's grave, paid our respects and everything. That's pretty cool. That's something I want to put on my bucket list. Can you imagine, though, like getting called up and just thrust into this band and going on tour? No. Like, how do you, how does someone even wrap their head around that and do it? Yeah, crazy. Especially someone that, I mean, his technical chops, I, I heard of Ron Thal back in the Shrapnel Records, Mike Varney, Guitar Shredder days where a lot of those guys came from. So he had the technical chops, but even to hear how as an accomplished technical guitar player, he was inspired by those ACDC videos when he was up on that big stage and had to bring it with a huge rock and roll band like, or like Guns N' Roses, you know? Yeah, very cool. Let's see what he has to say. They got spirit. You know, you know that they're doing it out of something real and legit. It's not like they're trying to write a hit. They're not trying anything. They're not trying. They're just doing 
you know, they're just giving who they are and what they are, and and it's good. You know, longevity, they never gave up, they stuck around. And they didn't give up on themselves. That's one thing. Two, they wrote damn good songs. Three, they played them really well, better than anyone else could. Nobody could play ACDC shit better than ACDC, you know? You're not gonna do it better than them. Don't even fucking try, you're gonna embarrass yourself. They had character, they had personality. You could imitate them, you know? You could, they had that much personality to them that you can dress like Angus and people know who the hell you are. They had damn good songs, they kicked the shit out of those songs, and they didn't, they didn't fucking give up, man. All that stuff is just one of the building blocks that when it's time for you after, you know, for me 30 years of doing this shit, to just play, all of those things are part of, you know, they, they help me to, to be wherever the hell I'm at now. So like, whatever I'm doing is because when I was nine, you know, I was running around the room like a nut, you know, trying to be little mini Angus. And that's one of those building blocks that when I'm in the studio, you know, trying to come up with stuff that made me part of who I am. So, yeah. All right. So there you go, Martin. There's a, there's one of our interviews that's loosely linked to Guns N' Roses. I mean, not, not loosely. It's, it's linked to Guns N' Roses. But uh, Bubblefoot was such a cool dude and such a gracious guy to take the time to talk to us. And, and you know... Some of these interviews that we did for the film really didn't warrant a whole podcast episode. So it, I'm glad that we had a chance to kind of wedge that in. And, and I'm glad you asked the question. All right. Our next question is from Matthew Jorgensen from Queensland, Australia. He says, love the show. It made me dig deeper into tracks like Touch Too Much, Walk All Over You, and Down Payment Blues. You often talk about the personality of the band. A lot of that is from our culture in Australia, especially in the 70s. I think your audience would get great insight into the band's DNA if you spoke with a contemporary like Angry Anderson from Rose Tattoo. We have so many great bands from that era that are relatively unknown outside Oz, and they were all doing the same circuit, influencing each other. The Tats, The Angels, Billy Thorpe, The Divinals, Midnight Oil, Australian Crawl, Hoodoo Gurus, and Cold Chisel, the best rock band from Australia after ACDC. Play the Tats Bad Boy for Love and compare. It's ACDC with Slide. I'm sure you get a lot of suggestions, but there is mine. Good luck for 2021. Looking forward to your next episode. Actually, I was playing some Rose Tattoo today. You were? Yeah, it was awesome. I mean, I, I read because through of this, this and or I, on your own. No, I, re- I read the question um, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to play some. And it's just I didn't realize that they got back together and toured a short tour in 2019. So truth be told, we did actually, because of your letter, Matthew, reach out to uh, Rose Tattoo. We were dying to have an interview with Angry Anderson and the bass player, who just so happens to be Mark Evans of ACDC. Uh, so not sure if that's going to ever happen, but that is on our bucket list for sure. It would be a great episode for sure. I, I hope hope they uh, will come around and, and want to do, do an episode with us. That would be fun. Maybe live. We could oh, go, yeah. we could get a flight, go to Sydney. Well, I've never been to Australia, so this is, this is the opportunity. I think so. No, that's cool, Matthew. Thanks for uh, sending that in. That's uh, where I always like to have positive reviews. And we'll be looking to crash at your pad when we do uh, show up for the live interview. So. Did 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 he did he miss any Australian bands that you guys love growing up? You know, I, I mean, there's a band that they're they're not contemporaries with ACDC in that same scene at the time, but a little bit later in the '90s, Powderfinger, which I love. Um, okay, and I know that they shared Brendan O'Brien as a producer. Uh, cool, with ACDC. Yeah. Um, those guys are great if anyone uh, hasn't checked them out. Okay, so now for our last question, we have Maximilian in Lubeck, Germany. He says, thanks so much for creating such a well-produced show. I've enjoyed the diverse guests and the knowledgeable interview banter. I even love the theme song for your podcast. It sounds to me like an unreleased ACDC instrumental, but I know this must not be true. Can you tell us where the song originates? I love this question. And I love it because you know we get a lot of a lot of people asking about it. So um, it's actually a, it's a 
it's a song that we had custom written for us and it goes back to when we were working on the film and we needed some music to kind of go out and and pedal the trailer so this song was put together specifically uh for that by a friend who we had met along this journey and and decided to do it and they uh he created a song called trailer trash which yes. is really really kind of fitting and fun and um it's just it was meaningful that someone that we had stopped along the way to talk to um, about ACDC, who was a musician and wanted to do this for us, which was really kind of touching. So it's great, great to have this. And, and Kirk can tell more about the story of how, how the song came about and, and how the original interview came about. Yeah. So we, we have, a, I suppose we have a trilogy of guitar heroes here today on this episode. Uh, So this gentleman's name is Gannon Arnold, and Gannon has been the lead guitar player for Joe Walsh and also was in his band, his own band uh, with Taylor Hawkins and the Coattail Riders, uh, which is where we first met Gannon. I think it was at the NAMM show. Well, we had had met him in Seattle first, right? Yeah. And that was for, yeah, for a different project, actually. Right, and then we met Gannon back down in Nam when he was playing with the Coattail Riders, and we filmed those guys live. Got to meet uh, Taylor Hawkins. Awesome. And uh, man, that guy hits the drums hard. Oh my God, so hard. he does. He does. And uh, Gannon was like, "Hey, I'll trade you some of that footage you guys just taped if uh, if you want me to write you a, a, an original score for your soundtrack." We're like, "Yes." So. Um, <laughs> Boy, did he nail the ACDC sound. Yeah. We've heard yeah. so many times from, you know, even, even people we've interviewed are asking, like, how did you find that hidden ACDC song or something? He just really, just the style, it's just, just great. That's his world. And to create that sound, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do, but he can really kind of, he knows his instrument and he knows how to make it sound a certain way. And it's just it's a joy to sit there and watch him play. And little known fact, he plays every instrument yeah, in that song. Yeah, 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 not yeah. just the guitar, it's amazing. Uh, we actually yeah. get a call from Classic Rock Magazine. The editor wanted to feature our story as a, as a cover story. And as a part of that issue, they put the trailer as a DVD inside the issue. And the last phone call they put into us was, I don't think we're going to be able to use that ACDC song you guys have in there. And we said, it's not an ACDC song. <laughs> And they were like, are you sure? <laughs> and we were like, we're sure. It's Gannon. So, uh, yeah, we actually uh, have a full version, which you've never heard before, but it, it's quite impressive. But the cool thing is we, we interviewed Gannon in Seattle, and uh, he, too, is an ACDC fan, and he was quite knowledgeable. So uh, do we want to jump into a little bit of that interview? <laughs> Has anybody talked about Angus Young's guitar playing at all? Well, the one thing I always liked about ACDC was Angus Young, obviously, pretty amazing guitar player. Had a ton of energy. I remember seeing videos of him back in the, you know, when I was learning how to play guitar, I'd watch them on TV and just watching that guy do this whole thing. And, you know, and I liked when he'd do his unaccompanied guitar solo, right? Because it'd just be craziness. And I like his vibrato, too, because it's like, you know. It's like, it's kind of sloppy, but it's cool, no matter what. You know, it's like he's got all those. All that Chuck Berry stuff, but like really fast. It's taking this whole concept and just going 100 miles per hour with it, you know. So huge fan of Angus Young. He's great. Because definitely his guitar style was reminiscent of Chuck Berry. Because he had those, like I said, he had that lick. And his vibrato is pretty wild, too. So not that Chuck Berry had a wild vibrato, but... It just sounded like he was coming out of that kind of school, Chuck Berry and old fashioned rock and roll. In fact, they just sound like they sound like an old fashioned rock and roll band, you know, from the fifties and sixties, except with heavy distortion. But their roots are definitely like blues and, and old fashioned rock and roll, I think, you know. They'd probably say you're an idiot for me saying that, but it's what it sounds like to me, you know. And British rock too. You know, it sounds like they listen to you know, I'm sure Angus Young is a big fan of the Yardbirds and Jeff Beck and all those guys, you know. One of the my one of my favorite guitar riffs is uh you know, that's an amazing riff, you know. And you know, the one thing about them is that a lot of people don't talk about their groove factor, the rhythm section of ACDC. 
is so tight between Malcolm Young and I, I think Phil Rudd was the drummer, right? Phil Rudd. I mean, if you took away the singing and some of the crazy guitar stuff going on the top, over the top of it, I mean, the rhythmic factor, like the rhythmic stuff going on in that band is amazing how tight they are. That's, I think that's what people respond to. And the same goes for Led Zeppelin. You hear those bands play, but there's something that draws you to it outside of just, you know, cool tunes and good guitar playing. There's like a, there's a, a, like a rhythmic pulse to it, you know, that's different than most rock bands, you know, and they definitely have that. It's funny because they're very simple. A lot of the music's really simple, but they have these riffs that just stick in your head and don't go away. You know, like I was playing Whole Lot of Rosie uh, a little while back. You know, it's just a great little rock and roll riff, but you'll remember that. You know, there's something about their style of rock that is kind of lacking in the newer bands. You know, that one thing I noticed recently, and I think ACDC is kind of a last of a dying breed of that kind of style, is that the bands when they started, what it was like 76, maybe before that, probably 74, right? Then they have an album called Jailbreak or something like that. And so before them was the Beatles, the Stones, and before those guys was Muddy Waters and Chuck Berry and all those kind of blues acts. You know, and I think what was cool about ACDC is they took all that stuff and filtered it into their own rock sound, you know? But it was always based on emotional blues playing. You know, you always had the roots of the blues in their music, you know? And I think that's kind of what's lacking in today's music is is kind of the roots of music, the blues and, and rhythm and blues especially. Like we were talking about the rhythm section, that's going back to rhythm and blues, you know, the bass and the drums and how tight they are. They have that, you know, and I think that's what's infectious about their music, you know. They have like these riffs that people can, you know, they just want to go, yeah, you know. It's just one of those bands. Well, I got into ACDC around 12, maybe even younger, and the first album I bought was Let There Be Rock, and that was Bon Scott era, and I like that that riff I just played. That was one of my favorites, and um, I used to listen to that album all the time. And uh, I just thought that was amazing, you know. And like you said, there's a power to their music, you know. It's just the one thing that's great about those guys too is that they're just they're in a room and they're playing, you know. There's no Pro Tools or none of that stuff. It's just all those guys are good players, you know. They can they can really do it. That's why they've lasted all these years because when they go on stage, they can deliver. You know, and, the, and when you watch them, it's not like a Britney Spears concert where you got like somebody lip syncing on the corner and there's some burlesque dancer, you know. <laughs> it's like you got one dude on there in a, in a schoolboy outfit rocking out, you know, going across the stage and it's, it's pretty amazing, you know. In any style of music and even like the Disney music, like these girl, like they put together like Selena Gomez and these acts, you know, it all comes back to ACDC, these riffs, you know. <laughs> They're all drawing upon that kind of sort of ACDC's kind of vibe. They all want to get that. The problem is that you can't really capture that without the soul, you know. That's what ACDC has, and I think that they're super influential, you know. Whenever you come up with a cool guitar riff, you're thinking ACDC, you know. And you're probably thinking some other people too, Led Zeppelin, ACDC. I mean, all those acts are running through your head for sure when you're thinking of a cool riff. Who wouldn't want to write back in black? <laughs> If you go in the studio and just record something that sounds ACDC-ish, it's not going to be cool because it's already been done. You know, it's like they've done that and they've made it so amazing. You know, that, that they're, they're one of those bands, it, them and Zeppelin, again, if you go in the room and you try to do an ACDC kind of song, it's not going to be, it's not going to work because it's like, oh, that sounds like ACDC. Here it is. <laughs> I played it wrong, but love you guys. I played it wrong. Sorry. It's close enough. That's great. That's so cool. And, and I think uh, that's so cool. And I think in season three, we definitely need to get some more people get their guitars out during the interviews. That's I agree. a that's a really cool thing. We yeah. want some lessons. Yeah. One of the reoccurring themes that we hear from a lot of people is, you know, ACDC is hard to play. Don't even don't even try. You know, so many so many guitars have said that, and I think it's just an homage to Angus and and Malcolm really and how easy the songs sound to play, but just go ahead and try it. And then you, you realize it's not easy. And thank you, listeners. And um, thank you, guitar heroes, Johnny Winter, Bumblefoot, and Gannon Arnold going beyond the thunder with us uh, and unravel this mysterious, alluring entity that is called ACDC. And, you know, to close this show out, I think it's probably pretty fitting to just do the extended cut that Gannon did for us for Trailer Trash. 
Yes. So Eric, if you want to you want to play us out, you know, um, he did a great job. And, and, and just a shout out to Gannon. Thanks for, for doing that for us. It's Thank you, Gannon. Definitely very cool. And our listeners love, love the song. Here it is. Turn it up. Shazbot. Nano Nano.